Hello everyone, this is Fiona Apollo, and today I wanted to look into something that I've seen more and more people both condemn and also turn to in seemingly equal measure, media piracy. For as long as media consumption has been a thing, people have always been trying to find ways to obtain a product or receive a service through illegitimate means, and the online sphere is most definitely not an exception. If anything, it's only really made the act more visible, rather than doing anything to enable or reduce it. The more you push back against something, while some people might get the hint, others will only double down and develop more roundabout methods to circumvent the boundaries put in place. When you ask someone what they think of media piracy, their first thought might be the idea of someone illegally obtaining a media property to distribute among other people for a profit. Either that or their mind jumps to those anti-piracy ads from the 90s, and that's definitely a thing that happens, don't get me wrong, but while we can all agree that this isn't the greatest use of someone's time or resources when there are already umpteen ways to obtain this media yourself, a discussion that has also risen up alongside it is the dilemma of media preservation. When streaming services became mainstream, it was seen as a seemingly perfect way to mitigate the threat of piracy as now, millions of households had access to a whole library of shows and movies without having to pay through the nose for purchasing physical media of these properties individually. Piracy actually reduced for a time, and things seemed to be getting better, until the old men in suits decided to be greedy, and now we have a million different streaming services, all requiring a subscription during a time when many people are struggling to make ends meet, and not only do you run the risk of your favourite show getting cancelled, or even being removed entirely from the platform if it isn't an immediate success by proxy of the excessive amount of choice present on these platforms, people are also turning to piracy because many of these shows are now at risk of becoming lost media. It's actually gotten to the point where even the creators of certain shows don't get the chance to see the media they create be published to a platform, or be able to view it legally themselves. Dana Terrace from The Owl House, for example, had to find out that the last few episodes of her show had been released through media leaks, and shows like Over the Garden Wall were removed entirely not long ago, leading to a spike in price hikes of the series on DVD. And I have several words, several long and difficult to pronounce words to say about the treatment of Infinity Train. So today, I wanted to go into a history of media preservation, the rise of streaming, the changing attitudes towards piracy as a whole, and ultimately some ways that these media can be preserved through other means. There is a really fascinating moral debate going on surrounding this, and I wanted to put it into the spotlight because I will be honest with you all, I don't always believe in abiding by the law when it comes to freedom of information, and that's exactly what a lot of these media properties are. They are first and second hand sources into so many things such as ideas and priorities from the time periods they were made in, whether they be sitcoms, action movies, or otherwise. They all give us an insight into a small piece of history. The only reason we know so much about certain parts of the past is through books, poems, songs, artworks, and other such sources. And film and TV are just as much a part of that. I really hate that media has become so devalued that this is now such a contentious topic, and I have a lot of thoughts about whether this may be contributing to things like a decline in media literacy and other such issues. So here we are. If you like the sound of this, then please consider liking and subscribing. I talk a lot about pop culture and the effects of certain media, particularly regarding animation, as that's where my main interests lie. Please note that a lot of my more opinionated notes within these videos are purely speculative and not based in fact, unless stated otherwise. What do you guys think of pirating movies and shows? Do you do it? Do you know how to do it safely? Would you like to? Please let me know. All right, let's do this. So first things first, let's go back in time a bit and have a look at what media accessibility and preservation was like in the past to give an idea as to how things have developed and how such circumstances can ultimately lead to piracy. Without going into too much of a rabbit hole, because technically we could go into the history of mass-produced media at large, which is typically attributed to Johannes Gutenberg's 15th century invention of the movable printing press, I'm going to try and keep things more or less oriented towards the history of cinema. With regards to the rise of cinemas in particular, in 1891, an employee of the Edison Company, William Kennedy Laurie Dickinson created a prototype machine called the Kinetoscope, which enabled one person at a time to view moving pictures. To use a Kinetoscope, you had to look through an eyepiece on the top of the machine and you would be shown a film that typically only lasted about 20 seconds. The first Kinetoscope shown to the public was in 1893, and by 1894 it was considered a commercial success, with public parlours popping up all around the world. And while this is a fascinating tidbit of movie history, the Kinetoscope wasn't exactly developed to show a film to more than one person at a time. So following this, the first people to present projected moving pictures to a paying audience were the Lumiere brothers in Paris in 1895. They used a device of their own making, the cinematograph, which was a camera, a projector, and a film printer all in one. In the very beginning, films were often only a few minutes or so long and were shown in places like fairgrounds or music halls. Despite the popular notion that movies were often silent, they actually often also included live music or even relied on audience participation similar to pantomime. And by 1914, cinema 
was becoming regarded as an emerging art form with several European countries developing their own film industries. Following the First World War though, these industries took a big hit, and this allowed for American cinema to gain more prominence instead. With that, the rise of American cinema also coincided with the consolidation of Hollywood. Fun fact, the American film industry supposedly had its roots in New Jersey in the late 1800s. Some of the main reasons for motion picture companies shifting over to LA was due to it being cheap at the time, <laughs> imagine that, and also because the weather was much more reliable for filming. Following this came a boom of new productions, and as such, intrigue also grew with dedicated movie theatres popping up all over the states and the rest of the world. So now that we have the foundations for the rise of cinema, how were the actual films that people saw created and preserved? Well, originally, movies were recorded on reels of film stock, and they were made of a highly unstable and flammable cellulose nitrate base, which required deliberate and careful storage to slow its inevitable deterioration, which often included being stored in vaults, which had carefully monitored climate and temperatures. Most films made on nitrate stock were really not well preserved at all though, mostly because it was bulky and took up space, the average feature film taking up 5 or 6 reels each and weighing about 60 pounds overall, but also because it was still believed that cinema was only a passing fad and wouldn't stand the test of time. So better methods of preservation weren't conceived until a later time. By around 1918, once the war ended, you need to remember that the overall film industry was only about 27 years old by this point, so as the years went on, many film negatives and prints eventually just crumbled away into nothing. And what's also really sad about this is that after the incorporation of sound in the 1930s, many studios didn't see the need to preserve the earlier silent films because of their limited commercial run, so they were destroyed intentionally. And this is the reason that most of the movies from the black and white silent era of cinema are considered permanently lost media. Unfortunately though, colour films are also experiencing film decay. Technicolor films, which had about five different versions of the Technicolor process created from 1916 onwards and are still created using the fifth version today, are experiencing a rapid deterioration, which is incredibly worrying considering there are a great many films that are at risk of losing their original and only physical copies. Cellulose acetate film, which was the initial replacement for nitrate, has been found to suffer from vinegar syndrome, which is basically where cellulose acetate releases acetic acid, the key ingredient in vinegar, which accelerates degradation within film and it can also damage surrounding film and metals containing them. This is a real tragedy for film history, and while many film preservationists are doing their best to prevent this, the degradation of films that were already locked away in private studio vaults isn't really something that can be helped by the public, especially considering the fact that the public probably don't even realise that some of these films exist due to there being only one copy. And with that being the case, why would they even give a damn about the loss of a film they never even saw and therefore couldn't form an attachment to? So in terms of accessibility in order to foster said attachment, what changed? Well, in the 1950s, home televisions became much more affordable and were now turning into a staple in the homes of thousands of regular people. With this came the introduction of TV channels, but also the concept of watching films that were telecast directly to their homes instead of going to a movie theatre. Because there weren't many channels at the time, oftentimes only two or three in the really early days, options were pretty limited, but as the years went on, more channels became available and also more films could be allocated to different time slots with the addition of dedicated movie channels, which meant that the average person who maybe didn't have the money or time to go out to the movie theatre could still have access to movies and TV. But TV did present one limitation of the time. Unlike modern day where you can pause, record and save your favourite shows and movies to be watched over and over again, once it was broadcast on TV back in the day, unless they decided to show the same movie or episode again at a later time, that was it. If you missed it, you missed it. There was no way to record the media you saw in any kind of way. That is, up until 1971, when the first video cassette recorders, or VCRs for short, were released by Sony that were fit for consumers and could be mass produced. Initially, the price tended to scare people away, but by the late 80s this levelled out and VCRs were made affordable and practically rocketed into the mainstream. Following this, VHSs, or video home systems, also came onto the market and won out against VCRs in the aptly named videotape format war between the late 70s and 80s, making VHSs the dominant home viewing format. Video cassettes were the breakthrough in movie accessibility that people had been waiting for since television became a regular appliance in people's homes, as they finally made it possible for consumers to buy or rent a complete film and watch it at home whenever they wanted, rather than having to go to a movie theatre or having to wait until it was broadcast on TV. This also birthed an industry in of itself revolving around recorded media. Video rental stores such as Blockbuster were established, and it also created a huge shift in viewing practices for audiences. People didn't have to wait for their favourite show to repeat since they could just record the episode onto tape and rewatch it whenever they so pleased. It also managed to create a big impact on revenue streams for the film industry at large, as it essentially gave a second chance to many films that may have initially done moderately or even poorly in cinemas. These such films went on to be known as cult classics. However, this is where we begin to see the emergence 
of mass media piracy. Now that people were able to record their own versions of their favourite media, some found that they could mass record said media and sell it to pay in members of the public who maybe didn't want to pay theatre prices and didn't have VHSs of their own. Right from the first release of VCRs, movie studio executives became acutely aware of what this new technology could mean for their precious box office earnings. And so in 1975, the Motion Picture Association, or MPAA, enacted a plan to curb media piracy by increasing copy protection measures utilised by content providers and both creating and providing assistance to various governments to enact new laws surrounding this. This is also when we started to see disclaimers and such at the beginnings of movies and within the credits of both movies and TV shows stating that it's illegal to record and distribute these properties with the intention to make a profit. And this trend more or less continued into the 90s when DVDs became the dominant format for distributing and accessing media at home for the average person. VHSs were still used to actually record the media in question, but then the footage had to be burned onto the DVD through a computer. So I think it's worth noting here that the majority of people from the 80s to the early 2000s had at least a couple of VHSs or DVDs that were obtained through less than legal means, and a lot of the time this wasn't because people had nefarious motives or whatever, it was mostly for reasons like the media in question only being available in a different country or region, only having limited run, and things like that. If people wanted to enjoy a piece of media but had limited options on how to obtain it, piracy was often the most feasible solution. So when did things change? Why did we stop recording things to physical media? Well, that would be the internet. After the internet burst onto the mainstream and became a fast and efficient way for not just information, but entertainment and the like to be shared and distributed, this led to a whole wealth of different media being hosted on all different manner of platforms, mostly for free. Was it legal? Depends what it was. If you were watching anime on YouTube in three parts, then yeah, that definitely wasn't legal. But it was up and available, and did people really think the police were gonna come knocking on the doors of thousands of teenage weebs who happened to cross them? No, that wasn't happening. At worst, the person who uploaded the clips got slapped with a bunch of copyright claims, the clips would get taken down, and eventually the channel as well if they got enough strikes. That may have been more of a contentious subject if you went onto a dedicated website where media was illegally uploaded and also where you risk clicking on sketchy pop-ups and having some random lady's bits flash up on the family computer and also downloading a virus that stole your mum's credit card info, but that's pretty much par the course for such websites, so you know. The time in which this finally began to change and people's perspectives on piracy began to pivot was when streaming services like Netflix took the helm. Streaming provided a wonderful and efficient new way to catalogue thousands upon thousands of media properties without having to risk having your webcam hacked by a dark web hitman. And back when Netflix was the main streaming service and had practically everything on it from Disney movies to anime and whatever else you so wished for, it was great. You had a set fee to pay every month, you weren't having to pay for DVDs or box sets unless it was for a franchise that you adored, and everything was great and good. But that's not to say that Netflix was the first or only platform to do this, and there were a few others dotted around with similar concepts in the beginning, one such platform being Crunchyroll. Crunchyroll was founded in 2006 by a group of students at the University of California, and the site specialised in hosting content from East Asia, some of which included versions of East Asian anime and TV shows that had been subtitled by fans. Crunchyroll is quite an interesting case because in the beginning it did in fact allow uploads of material that wasn't officially licensed, but then Crunchyroll eventually began securing legal distribution agreements with companies, and after announcing a deal with TV Tokyo to host episodes of Naruto Shippuden. Once this happened, Crunchyroll began removing all copyright infringing material from its site and only hosting content that it had legitimate distribution rights to showcase. And while I do understand why they did this, I can only imagine that there may have been some shows and such that were removed which Crunchyroll have never managed to secure the license agreements for. But alas, it wasn't a huge issue at the time, and for a while, platforms like Netflix and Crunchyroll had quite a monopoly on their respective corners of the online entertainment sphere. That is, until The Rat decided that it also wanted a piece of the pie. Once Disney announced that they would be launching their own streaming services as well, that just seemed to be one of the things which broke the dam, and all of a sudden there was an explosion of different services popping up. What's even worse is that when launching its service, Disney also pulled every Disney property from the other services like Netflix so that you could only watch them through Disney itself. Obviously, because of this, some services tried to garner their own niches in an attempt to stand out with varying degrees of success. Netflix had its original series, Crunchyroll had anime, etc. The only service really that comes to mind which has had anything akin to this is HBO, which boasts an impressive list of Cartoon Network titles, but this is mostly from having an agreement with entities like Cartoon Network to distribute its properties. And this, unfortunately, is where things begin to take a turn. Because all these platforms are now battling it out in a bid to win over audiences, what has started to become the deciding factor in whether any of the titles showcased on them had any longevity was almost always their initial reception. If a series wanted to have more than one season, or even stay on the platform at all, then its production needed to be cheap, be made in a short amount 
of time, and the end result had to be a hit within the first week of release. If a show fails to do this, and this especially seems the case if it's animated, then that's it. The show gets axed from further production, or just gets yeeted off the platform. And we already have so many examples of this happening. In August 2020, while Infinity Train Book 3 was releasing on HBO Max, the whole crew and most of the production staff had been laid off, and then in March 2021, it was announced that Infinity Train would end with its fourth season. Sadly, profits reign supreme, and if a show wasn't profitable, it runs the risk of being cancelled and even removed without much warning, even to the people working on it. And this is especially a big risk with animated shows because, unfortunately, animation is very expensive to create. About a year ago, HBO Max also happened to remove about 32 titles, both live action and animated from its service, notably ones that belonged to Cartoon Network, including Aquaman King of Atlantis, OKKO, OK and others. These cancellations are extremely dismissive of any kind of appeal these titles have that doesn't directly correlate to an immediate massive success, and it is frustrating. It's also heavily ignorant of things like seasonal leanings, niches, and other such factors that might make a series appealing to a dedicated and consistent audience. Over the Garden Wall, for example, is an acclaimed short series from Cartoon Network which has a very specific kind of appeal. The show is usually watched as a seasonal thing during the fall or on Halloween because of its autumnal associations. But streaming algorithms don't see that, and Over the Garden Wall got removed from HBO or Max or whatever the hell it's called these days, just before this time of the year was coming up. And this just really rubbed people the wrong way. Granted, the series is still viewable on Hulu instead, so it's not permanently lost at least, and there are still a few DVDs in circulation, but look at how much people are charging for them on eBay because of this. It's ridiculous. What's even worse is that this has begun to affect media that hasn't even been released to the public yet. Combined with the reduction in merchandising for various media, this also means that physical versions of the series, like DVDs, soundtrack CDs, and the like, are no longer being produced. This now typically only happens for big franchises with high demand, and even then, only a limited amount gets created. Because people just don't see the point in having physical libraries of media anymore, especially not when you have a digital library all online anyway. This means that once Netflix, Hulu, Prime, Disney+, Plus, or whatever hellish corporation decides not to host that series on their platform anymore, it's being deleted without a single trace of its existence outside of word of mouth. So this one is a bit of a role reversal in regards to the overall topic here, but it is one that has caused an absolute upset among fans of the property in question. A hybrid live-action animated film, Coyote vs. Acme, which centers on Wile E. Coyote from Looney Tunes, was set to release in movie theaters in July 2023, and was completely finished production-wise, like the entire film was done. It was completed. But despite this, Warner Brothers instead chose to swap the film out to release the Barbie movie in its place, and then later on, it came out that the film would not be released in favor of being used as a $30 million tax write-off. None of the crew were told about this until after production was over, and once it came out, many voiced their frustrations online, leading to calls from the general public for Warner Bros. to release the film, which are still ongoing. And the reason I say this was a role reversal is because streaming services did in fact try to purchase the rights to host the film on their services, but they were all turned down. What I will give these platforms credit for is that in many cases, especially in regards to feature films, services like Netflix have done a good job of allowing certain titles the chance to flourish, one such example being Nimona, after it got junked by Disney. Speaking of Disney, what can also be an issue is that many of these platforms also region lock certain media, meaning that if you don't live in the right part of the world, if you want to watch a certain show, or at the least watch it before other people post spoilers online, you either have to wait for it to become available, which might never even happen, use a VPN, which are now becoming vilified targets for anti-piracy campaigns by these companies, or you download it illegally. And what's especially ridiculous is that some shows are region locked in countries where that property would absolutely thrive. Disney Plus has actually recently launched a series called Iwaju, set in Nigeria, but guess what? Actual people living in Nigeria can't watch it because Disney Plus isn't available in their country. So with all of this happening, is it any wonder that people are turning to piracy? Are the suits really that surprised? If someone likes a show enough that has been done a disservice by its own platform, that person will go out of their way to preserve it? Well... What's really interesting about the perspectives around piracy now versus back in the 80s and 90s when it was at its peak is that I think a lot of the negative associations come down to a fear of the unknown. The average person back then had a good grasp on how to record their own media using VHS or by burning CDs and DVDs because the technology was new and already in their homes. Whereas now, it doesn't feel like as many people know how to go about recording certain media in a safe way because they've grown up in an age of convenience, which seems to actively discourage knowing how to do these things. A lot of restrictions have been 
put in place, such as streaming platforms disabling screenshots and screen recording. And while some more tech savvy individuals may know how to bypass this, I feel like it's mainly people in generations like Gen X or millennials who grew up with a lot of rapidly changing technological advances that understand how to do this more, because they grew up having to learn to adapt to it. And it's not just the younger generations who have issues with accessibility of certain media. Do you want to know who is the worst for pirating shows and movies that I know of? My nan. <laughs> she doesn't know how to safely navigate the internet, nor does she have her own recording equipment, and pensioners can't be spending all their money on these different streaming platforms. So what she does instead is if there's a particular show or film she really wants to see, instead of paying for any one subscription service, she literally pays a guy she knows to burn them onto DVDs at a discounted price. It's usually like two or three quid or something to pay for the blank discs and cases he gets for them, and then she hands them to my parents if she doesn't like them. But yeah, no. Moral of the story is that in the name of preserving your favourite media and in terms of accessibility, I personally wouldn't condemn someone from doing what they have to if there's a chance that media could be lost permanently. If there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, then what's the difference doing otherwise? I know that some people are a bit apprehensive of this as they think it will impact their favourite creators, and at least as far as that goes, if the property is available on a streaming site, then I will 1000% recommend you watch it legally to prove to these platforms that these shows deserve to be funded, created, and showcased. But in that same vein, the production crew will have already been paid by the time it hits your screen, and streaming is notorious for there being practically no way of claiming residual payments through them, so please don't think that you are taking away an innocent person's livelihood. In the animation world especially is where I've seen the sentiment quite a bit, especially with the closure of Cartoon Network. There are a lot of cartoons that weren't deemed good enough or popular enough to be put on DVD or added to a streaming service that I wish could be preserved as much as possible. God, a couple I can think of off the top of my head are Magus XLR and Hi Hi Puffy Amiyumi. Like, I remember these from my childhood, and it's just really sad there's a chance that other people may never get to watch them. And if you really would prefer not to play into piracy, I personally couldn't recommend enough trying to see if your local libraries have the ability to stock certain media titles. Obviously, this is going to depend on the library itself and also the rules surrounding whether certain titles can be obtained by them. I did try to do some digging on this as to what the rules and limitations were surrounding asking your local library to stock shows and movies that may not be available anywhere else for archival purposes, but I kind of came up empty. I also paid a trip to one of the big city libraries near me, but it was a <laughs> crawling with students and all the staff I could get hold of seemed to only be volunteers who knew about as much as I did. But if any librarians have some insight on this, I would honestly love to hear from you. Anyway, I think that's everything from me. Thank you so much for watching, and if you liked what I had to say, then please consider liking and subscribing and sharing your thoughts on this topic. I may or may not take a bit of a longer break between long-form videos after this because I want to try and work on a proper Little Mint and Friends short next month, but we'll see on that. It depends on how organised and how broke I am. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all again, stay safe everyone, and I will speak to you all soon. Bye!